Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box, and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on June 30th. We will not have a webinar next week. And on June 30th, we, have a, we will have a webinar um, that is a family search Q&A with Catherine Grant. Um, if you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on discovering your ancestors in Wales. Um, James has over 39 years of experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy's Star Blog and Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He has served as a family history volunteer for 17 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Um, and James, if you're ready, we will turn over the time over to you. Okay. And then I will get this going. Okay, hope everybody can see that. We are going to talk today about discovering your ancestors in Wales. We had a change of the time of this webinar uh, from 5.30 to five o'clock. And so I will probably mention about 5.30 to anyone who tunes in late that um, these webinars are recorded and available on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, I just looked it up and we have, as of the date of this webinar, we have 549 um, videos on that. Not all of those are webinars. Some of them are shorter um, instructional videos, but most everything there is a, a great a variety of, of topics about genealogy and, and uh, how to do it. So we're gonna, gonna talk today about whales and um, we'll get started here. Interesting, some background. It's very important that as we begin to understand or begin to do research, into uh, our ancestors from any particular country that we at least have some basic uh, history facts to go by. Um, it, the important thing here is that uh, uh, records that are significant genealogical records that we would need or use to be uh, to discover our family are kept by different we'll call them jurisdictions. Um, they're kept by different entities that, uh, that create records. And in, this, in the case of Wales, Wales is a country, but it's also part of another country called uh, presently Great Britain. And uh, it has historically uh, been uh, back and forth with wars and things like that. And so what you need to know about the country is important, what you need to know about the country is the history, which is important to understanding that the records, where the records are kept or where they might end up. And so as we go through this, you'll see that there's, uh, there's some things about whales that make it unique as far as doing research. Well, you're obviously not going to get records back 230,000 years. So we'll probably need to jump forward quite a bit the first inhabitants were Celtic or Celtic Britons who spoke Britonic, and they split into Welsh, Cumbric, Cornish, Breton, and possibly Pictish. And what I'm, you're seeing here is a, an animation on the screen that shows you uh, a time a timeline, 
and then the changes in the languages that were spoken in uh, various parts of, of the British Isles. And uh, you'll see that modern English only comes in if we go by this uh, at least one more time and then we'll move on, uh, comes in about right now, 1500 AD. Now, what does that really mean? Uh, what that means is that if you go back in time doing research on your family and you start to get into the 1500s, um, which is sometimes possible and not, not usual and to, unless you happen to, to link up with a uh, royal or a noble line that, that is well documented. Most of the records that you'll find uh, that would be associated with finding people individually uh, begin to disappear almost completely by the mid 1500s, like 1550. It's kind of my cutoff date for any kind of realistic research. Before that, very simply, is that English ceases to exist as it is exists today and becomes a language called Middle English. And that is uh, basically the same as if you were trying to learn French or German or Spanish or Italian or whatever you would still, you would have to learn Middle English in order to understand those records if they're written in English. So they may also be written in Latin because Latin was the kind of universal language back then. So um, this, is a, this is very important to understand this as a, uh, a limiting factor in, in what we're able to do and what we're able to learn. But one other thing that's important to understand is that as these, uh, as during these time periods, there were various other uh, cultures who had uh, a great impact on what happened in Wales or what happened in England or any of the other British Isle countries. And the one important one is that the Romans gained control of Wales in uh, the year 79 of the Common Era. The Common Era is the same as AD or the, Lord, the year of our Lord. Um, but the Common Era 79, from that time forward, the, there was a domination of this whole area by the, uh, by the Romans and their language which was not the same as Italian because Italian actually didn't gain ascendancy until quite late. But at that time, there are lots of, there's still lots of things in England and lots of place names that date back to this time period and to end in Wales. And interestingly, the founder of Wales is considered to be Magnus Maximus in 383. And so that during those 300 years, they had the Romans um, who were controlling this area. And you'll see that there are uh, in a lot of place names on this particular one, there are different names for different places. Uh, some of them are the current names and then the names that, that were in existence back in uh, in Roman times, but you'll also see a few of the places that still have the same name. So they date back that far. So we have a, a mixture here of uh, the early, um, what we might call Latin language that was spoken by the Romans. And then in 1282, uh, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd led to the conquest, conquest of the Principality of Wales by King Edward I of England Afterwards, the heir who was the heir apparent to the English monarch has borne the title, titled the Prince of Wales. So when you listen to what the, uh, uh, the listing of all of the, the, the different royalty uh, things that are said about kings in England, uh, one of those is that they are the Prince of Wales, which meant that they were uh, the controlling nobility uh, royalty of, uh, of Wales from that time. So it's been a long time that England and Wales have been um, closely ruled by the same government. And because of its Celtic origins, because it goes back to that Celtic 
the country is bilingual with both Welsh and English. Uh, we are, there are uh, a few, not a, a, an overly uh, large number, but there are a few countries that are bilingual. Canada, for example, is uh, both officially a French speaking and English speaking country and all their signs in Canada have, uh, are both in English and, and French. And it, this is in Wales and the signs are both in uh, Welsh and in English. So that's going to have a pretty uh, important impact on how you do research and the town names that you, uh, and that you place the place names in, in Wales are also going to have two different names. One's going to be the English name and one will be the Welsh name. And the people will have two different names in Welsh and in English. And so it gets to be an, a, an interesting challenge when you're trying to understand uh, the relationships between the people. You might remember, uh, perhaps not, uh, I can go back to this slide where it says Llewellyn App Gruffydd. Well, the app is the, um, is the son of or the patronymic. And so that's that word app meant that Llewellyn was the son of Gruffydd. And so all of these things come into play as you go back into, uh, into Welsh history and Welsh genealogical research. So now is uh, we need to take a look at the alphabet. There are basically three major ch challenges, four major challenges, we'll include four this time. Uh, of doing research as you go back in time uh, to do research in genealogy. The first of these um, challenges is uh, the language. And that is always a, a, the case when you move from a, uh, to a country that is not speaking your native language. So if you speak English, which you might, if you are predominantly, or if you're listening to this or some other language, then your challenge is moving to any other non-English speaking country. And in a sense, when you go to Wales, you are going to a non-English speaking country. There are still uh, native Welsh speakers in Wales that speak, that speak Welsh. And, uh, so, and, and as you go back in time, that becomes more and more uh, apparent and the research is, is more involved with uh, deciphering the Welsh place names particularly and the names of the people if they happen to be recorded in Welsh. So you can see the Welsh alphabet is, uh, is a significantly different than um, the, the alphabet that we use in English. It has a whole bunch of extra letters like the CH, the DD, the FF, the NG, uh, LL, PH, different ones uh, that I am not going to uh, reproduce in Welsh. Um, but why is this important? It's important because if the, the um, record that you're looking at is alphabetized, and if it's alphabetized in Welsh, then those letters in, uh, affect the, um, the the way that the letters are, are set out. In other words, the order of the letters in the alphabet come after any letter that began with, the, for instance, the CH would come after letters beginning with C. And this is uh, a, a little bit confusing at first, very confusing for people who have, not any, who have no background in, in moving from one language to another. Uh, I happen to speak Spanish very fluently and Spanish does have extra letters and it is uh, apparent because the entries in the in a dictionary or an encyclopedia in Spanish come out in different uh, in a different order than they do in English. And so you need to be aware of this particular fact of the importance of the language. Now the next next big challenge to the um, um, let me just go back to this one. The, the next big challenge besides the, the language 
is the handwriting. And the, uh, the other, the next big challenge is the, the, the importance of places and the place, places where things occurred and the names of those places. And then lastly, the, the, the challenge that you're faced with is the challenge of uh, the condition of the records that you're looking at. So the, quest, the question is, if you can find the record, which is it, whether it's accessible or not, and if you can then, once you have it, if it's in good enough condition that you can read it. Okay, so all of those factors are things that affect our lives as genealogists in, in attempting to, to work back in time. And we just have to use that. That's kind of the parameters of, the, of what you would call the real world of, of being uh, of doing genealogy. So here we have uh, the, uh, the symbol of Wales, which is the red dragon. And uh, understanding that because of the, uh, the early uh, conquest, if you want to call it that, in the absorption, absorption, absorption of Wales by England, you have the birth, death, and marriage records and military records are gonna be listed as English records with English records. So you're going to look, uh, you'll look in uh, like a big website that's uh, very uh, prominent in, uh, in Great Britain. It's just findmypast.com. And in Find My Past, you can do searches in England alone, or you can do in England or Wales, or you can do it in Great Britain, uh, but uh, uh, all of the records are there, right there with uh, the same sets of records. For example, the census records are the same. Now, when we're looking at records in Wales, we have to be uh, a little bit uh, aware of some, some kind of general time frames, but sometimes we need to be aware of specific times because the specific times tell uh, of, of what happened in those times would be dependent on um, what records are available and what, uh, what records are, were not available. The two major divisions in the records are those before and after set 1837. And 1837 is, a, um, uh, is the dividing point because before that time, you need to know your ancestors' religion. That means, uh, very simply, you have to do enough research to determine whether they were they were belong to uh, the Church of England, whether they were Protestants, and if they were Protestants, what their Protestant denomination was, or if they were non-believers or people not in any in, not affiliated with any of the churches. So basically, uh, you're looking for those people. Uh, the nonconformists are is the term used in, uh, in in Great Britain for people who did not belong to the Church of England, or whose and there were also a category of people whose religion was unknown. Now, why is this important? It's because before 1837, you re, we need to rely heavily on uh, on church records and. Uh, uh, the challenge is that, that the Church of English records, the records and the, before that, the Catholic records and the Catholic records, that there are a few of those records also. The Church of England record and the, and the Catholic records are um, fairly available. Um, they're, they're depending on the county and depending on the, the area of uh, uh, inside of Wales that would be uh, that, that where the records were kept, the different time periods, they were available at different times, but they're generally available. And even if they aren't digitized today, there's, they're probably still available from, the, from the, either the, the parish or the diocese. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The nonconformist records, on the other hand, depended on whether or not the nonconformist church uh, kept records, and if those records, even if those records were kept, as to whether or not they are still available, and so they're a little bit harder to come by. 
uh, and it, uh, it makes it uh, more of a challenge if it turns out that your family is nonconformist. Uh, one of my family lines in England, and I do have uh, family lines in Wales, but one of my family lines in England disappears in the early 1800s and then kind of reappears back about a, about 100 years earlier but there's no way of connecting that earlier family to the to the ones in 1800 so it gets to be a little bit difficult and the reason was that they were nonconformists and it, we come to that conclusion is because they were all a whole families baptized at the same time into the cap into the church of england okay <clears throat> so when we start getting into research uh, in addition to knowing that magic number the 1837 time frame which we'll talk more about uh, you need to identify the county and the counties um, of, uh, of Wales have, uh, as they do in almost every country and place, uh, counties and states and provinces and all the other jurisdictions have changed somewhat and may change uh, according to their boundaries. And so one of the things that uh, is important also when you're doing research is to understand the historical um, relationship of the of the various uh, place locations and where they actually were at the time and so there's uh, there's lots of those records available maps and uh, and other records that tell exactly which records are available in which counties and so those are those are the, what we would need to look at in order to get involved in way in the in research in wales and it also helps you to get uh, familiar with the counties in the sense of uh, giving you distances because you may find two people which is very very common in Wales by the way there's a predominant number of people who have uh, the similar surname one of my ancestors surname is Thomas and Thomas was an extremely uh, common name and they're Morgan I have another Welsh family at Morgans and the Morgan name is tremendously common and then you have browns and some other very very common uh, names and you'll have two people with with the same surname but living close to each other but they may not be related at all and so it's it's uh, very important to do a very specific research into not just the counties but also down into each of the parishes the other geographic locations the Church of England inherited from the Catholic Church um, some doctrine, but also inherited the structure of the church. And so the, the Church of England is divided into parishes. Parishes are then combined into larger organizations of parishes called dioceses. And then there are larger organizations that go even higher than that from the standpoint of the um, uh, of genealogy, we focus on the parishes and to some extent on the diocese. There are possibilities that there are records at the diocese level that do not, uh, that, that are either duplicate, maybe duplicate missing records at the parish level, but also records that may be unique to the diocese. And to make it a little bit complicated, in 1974, uh, the British government decided to reorganize and rename a significant number of the counties in uh, both England and Wales. And so now we have the pre-1974 counties, and I'll switch back and you can see uh, a little bit of difference uh, in the way that the counties were arranged back before they were uh, rearranged in 1974. This is important when you're doing research in Wales because uh, when you look in a, in a uh, doing research in a direct in a catalog, for example, a catalog of records, you need to identify whether or not the catalog has used the pre-1974 name for the county or the and the area. An organization, or if it's been, it was cataloged 
before 1974. So that's, that's one of the keys to getting into it. And as you need to be careful with place names, you uh, to, as I've mentioned already, they're both in English and in Welsh. And you'll see that uh, there's some similarities perhaps between the two words. It may look like one's just spelled differently, but they're also said considerably different, uh, differently from uh, English to Welsh. And so there are uh, places to look for uh, that tell both the Welsh name and the English name of all the different places in, uh, in Wales. And this one, this particular reference is in the familysearch.org research wiki. It's under the search tab. If you look up at the top of the page there, you'll see it says family tree search. If you click on search, you'll see at the bottom of that drop down menu, um, the name, the research wiki. And the research wiki gives you uh, uh, lots of different resources for doing research in all the countries around the world, but particularly here in Wales. And you'll see on the right hand side of the screen that there's guided research, research strategies for whales. There's a record finder for whales. And then there are a lot of record types and you'll, and you'll find explanations in the research wiki for all of those different record types. In 1900, the Great Britain 1900 Gazetteer is a website and it's online and uh, you can you can go to that website by looking up the Great Britain 1900 Gazetteer uh, and you'll see down there there's a listing that says complete GB 1900 Gazetteer and uh, it's a Creative Commons document, meaning that it's not copyrighted. and You can download the entire Gazetteer if you wish to, but it has 2.55 million rows and it's based on raw data and it may not be that helpful. So what you want to look at perhaps is uh, get a website where they will actually search that. And this is the one where you'll get that information because you can uh, begin to uh, go search through these these documents or you can download the whole document um, there are other there are other websites uh, that also use that gazetteer and uh, and so doing searches for places online and my but by the way many of those places in fact almost uniformly every place uh, has been also has been added into the uh, to the research the Wikipedia program uh, online. So if you go to do searches uh, for places in Wikipedia, you can pretty well find any uh, of the, the different levels of jurisdictions from, from uh, streets up to, to uh, towns, up to uh, counties and provinces and, and all the other organizations that are important. It's called A Vision of Britain Through Time, if you want a reference to the website. And as we mentioned, these uh, webinars are recorded and posted to the BYU uh, Family History Library YouTube channel. And so they, you can go back and reference them. Uh, in addition, if there are some people that are now tuning in here at uh, the halfway mark, uh, you'll realize that this has been going for a while, and that was because it would, uh, for this, it was kind of a unique conflict, so we moved it back to five o'clock uh, to six o'clock, and uh, if you've missed the first half, you can, you can then be able to read, to, uh, to get that first half through uh, watching the BYU YouTube channel. So before 1837, church records are the main records that provide birth, marriage, and death information. And they also uh, provide uh, the information that uh, uh, in, in some cases, when the, when the record, when the priest wrote more record, more information in the record, then they may also supply the names of the parents um, in both birth as marriages. 
seldom though in death information. In fact, most of the death information is uh, burials. Uh, it's very uncommon to find uh, a notation of the actual death uh, date. And so when people say, I've been looking for the death record, they really need to look for a burial record. That's the one that'll be most likely to be found. And what we're showing here is a, uh, is a screenshot of Find My Past. I mentioned that already. That's a major uh, website for Brit Great Britain and has millions and millions of British records, including parish registers. And it has a very sophisticated search um, screen, search uh, engine, we'll call it. And uh, that will allow you to make uh, some very interesting discoveries about your ancestors as you use uh, they find my past search for search mechanism, search engine. So the search engine will give you, for instance, if you put in a last name, it will tell you how many records have that, include that particular last name. It gives you uh, there immediately when you put in a last name or surname, uh, an idea of how common that record is. Uh, the record, I mean, how common that surname is. The surname could be anywhere from, uh, I've seen the lowest I've ever seen in numbers of, of people with the surname in all of the records on Find My Past was about 111. And that was a, a very, very, very rare surname. And uh, you know, I immediately told the person that when I saw that, that yeah, you're probably related to all 111 of these people. On the other end of that spectrum, the names like Smith and Jones and Brown you're going to see millions of records with those names. And so uh, in between, you can kind of begin to judge how common any particular surname is. Another place, we're gonna go back to um, primarily three, three websites for uh, any kind of initial research you do. Now that doesn't, that doesn't exhaust the number of records or places that you can look for records in England and Wales and, and Scotland and all of the other great Brit countries in Great Britain, uh, and particularly not in Wales, but it is the place where you would be, uh, it, it would be advisable to start because it's very possible that those records are available and that a digitized copy of the record is available. Um, what you will run into in the realis in, realistically in countries when you're in these countries in England and Wales, when you're looking for a record um, that uh, usually more, more recent records than you have, um, meaning in the later part of, latter part of the 1800s and into the 1900s, you may very well run into situations where only indexes are available and that or transcriptions. And to get a copy of an original record, you may have to pay uh, to uh, the governmental agency to obtain a copy of that record of marriage records or death record or burial record or a, even a death record. So this is important. This is what's called the re a research page on Family Search. And Family Search has a page set up like this for every major country. And so what you can do uh, is go to the, the part where it says search, rec search, and you click and you get records, images, whatever. When you click on records, you go to what's called the historical record collections. And the historical record collections has a map on the, start on the main page. And that's an interactive map. You can then click on that map and, uh, and get a drop down list of the countries in different geographical areas. And once you do that, then you choose Wales and you will get the Wales page. What's on the Wales page are three, um, three different types of records uh, that are available uh, on family search. And we need to, you kind of need to understand that when you're looking on family search, that there are these three different types of records. The first type of records are records that are, are uh, have digital images and are indexed. And the, and the majority of the records in the, in the, or vast majority of records in the his, uh, 
historical record collections are not only digitized and available, but also uh, there's also some indexes and they're uh, all of the records, not all the records, but most uh, nearly all the records are indexed. But when we move out of the index records, we find out that there's a huge number of records and actually more than half of the records in uh, on family search uh, may almost probably as many as two thirds of the records on their website are not indexed. So if you do a name search, as it shows here, where you have fill in the name and do a search, you're, you're usually only searching about anywhere from a third to a little bit more than a third of all the records. The only other way to get to the records is to go to the catalog where most all the records are listed. And uh, in the catalog, you'll find um, a list of, uh, of by place and you'll go search by place, which is why it's important to know the places where your ancestors lived because you're going to have access to those records. There's no way you can search by someone's name. You simply have to find the records themselves and then work your way through any of the records page by page. Hopefully they may have an index or some other finding aid, but most of us end up looking page by page through those records. Now, there is a third set of records on family search and they are records that are not digitized, that are digitized, but they're not indexed and they're not in the catalog. So if you search in the catalog and or you search by name, then you have missed this whole big section of other records. And they are up there, you'll see above there in the top, it says records images, and they're the images. And what the images are, are the records that have been uh, digitized and are waiting to be cataloged and waiting to be indexed. So they'll be eventually incorporated into the catalog and sometime later uh, indexed and they'll be available for uh, to, to be searched. But now what you do is go to the records, put in the place and uh, on the images and uh, click and you'll see categories of records that are waiting to be digitized, waiting to be indexed or even cataloged. So these are the ones, let me just kind of review here. There's indexed historical records. Those are the ones in the, in the uh, historical record collections. There are image only historical records. Those are the ones found uh, in the catalog. Uh, and then you have historical images, which are not indexed or cataloged. So there's these different types of records. And here's a, a look at the, uh, the, the beginning screen for the image search. At this point in time, there are like 4.4 billion record images. Um, and this, were, this is where you'd put in Wales or whatever other country you were looking for, and you would see those records. Now, how do they get there? Well, uh, we, the family search has teams of, um, of digitizing people. Uh, who are taught are trained how to digitize the records, who are working around the world. And even during the pandemic, they were continually adding um, images. And those images are from records in all different places. And they, they come in uh, to uh, Family Search in Salt Lake City, and they are processed in a, by geographic location and uploaded to this particular set of records. And then as they are cataloged and as they are indexed, they are moved into the other parts of the family search website. So here's for an example of Wales of what that page would look like. You would see here that there are 17 different places where records have been gathered recently. And if you look at the total of uh, those different places, you'll see that there's 24,000 additional records like court records. These are court and will records. And so you would really want to have uh, the, you know, access to these records. And there's some 10,000 results of these particular, uh, of this particular type of record in this place. Um, Likewise, we have other finding aids. And um, 
one of the things that you may very well want to look at um, is the same kinds of things, the catalogs on the other large websites. Every one of the websites has that catalog. So for example, uh, the Find My Past, I've already showed that search screen. That search screen searches all of the records. And um, if you want to search a specific catalog, then there's a list on Find My Past of all of the records um, by alphabetical order, which is a little bit confusing because it's hard to find the records that you're looking for. But if you keep kind of searching around, you can find a specific record. But in the uh, record set, but also you can also do the same thing on in ancestry. So here, if I make all of the um, uh, apply the filters, I see that ancestry has uh, two hundred collections uh, with uh, millions of records from Wales, and uh, all sorts of records going clear back into the fifteen hundreds. So this is, uh, this is where we, the primary places where we can look. Now, why is the 1837 date that significant? That is because in 1837, uh, England, Wales, um, and to some extent, Scotland was kind of uh, tagged along, but began what was called civil registration. Now, civil registration is basically saying you have to report births, marriages, and deaths. And so we actually come up with death records that tell the date of death. And we have marriage records and we have um, birth records. So once that civil registration became um, uh, uh, imposed on, the, on England and Wales, then that, uh, that gave an additional set of records. They didn't stop keeping records in the churches but they added in another layer of records that, that makes them even more valuable to, um, to the people who are uh, who, like us who are doing research, genealogical research. So now uh, if you find a civil registration record, then you have a very specific date to go look in the parish registers. And even if the parish register isn't indexed, you'll be able to go to the date within that index, that parish register and uh, see if there's another record of that person. And both records may give additional information that will be helpful. Now, even though we do have the, the major websites, Family Search and Find My Past and, and Ancestry to, to look through, it's important that we understand that there are also local record sets and, uh, and information, newspapers, journals, uh, uh, city directories, all sorts of other records that may, be, uh, that may be helpful to us. And yet those records are not collected into the large websites. They are basically records that are digitized uh, and online through other sources. And this is the National Library of Wales. And they have, uh, they have quite a huge, quite a collection of records. Now, what if the records that they have are unique and you need to see them and they're not digitized? Well, you can hire local and uh, uh, genealogical researchers to go in and do the work for you or you could take a trip to Wales. Now, waiting until the pandemic is over and we actually have access to all our countries, then that's a different thing, but normally you could do that. Now, this is an interesting set of Wales, a set of records, and this one is online and is searchable. And what this was is the tithe maps. Now, the tithe uh, has some religious connotations and that's correct because uh, they were collected by the church, but they were assessed uh, by basically because the church was a state-run state, state run church, they were assessed against the property of the owners and all of the owners who had property are identified in the tithing lists. So you can get onto the maps here and actually begin to see and identify if you find your ancestor in the tithe uh, lists and uh, you can perhaps find their 
uh, their piece of property that they owned. And that would be an incentive to go look at it and, and visit the same place where your ancestor lived. Um, I just have to say that there are a lot of records to search. Uh, it, it's, it can become overwhelming as uh, every time I do one of these spe uh, country specific uh, webinars, I uh, start to find out that there's more records that ev even after many years of doing research that I still didn't know were there. And this is the Welch archives. And uh, they may be partially closed, but then there are uh, records online and available to be searched. And uh, it's always, uh, you can search the catalog and that will give you some idea. Now, whenever you find a set of records, whenever you find the actual name of how the records are been identified and or cataloged, it is always important to use that name as a general search term on uh, uh, using Google search on your on the internet because there may be another set of those records out there someplace and they may be um, accessible even though they're not accessible normally. Uh, this is another huge database. This is the Dictionary of Welch Biography. Uh, it's very possible that one of your ancestors uh, was somewhat prominent and was able to be found in this particular collection of, of names. So the, the uh, I guess the end, bottom line is this, the more you look, the more you're going to find. And the more you try, you get involved with uh, both the history and the language and the writing and writing and all of the other challenges that are out there in, uh, in, in learning and doing genealogical research, you'll find that, that it's really um, uh, very satisfying and very, uh, becomes very, very interesting the more that you find, because you'll find some sets of records and things that just will be a, a marvelous help to you. Now, kind of a, a, a personal note here. My great grandfather's name was David Thomas. Uh, my great great grandfather, excuse me, was David Thomas. And David Thomas, um, picked up a middle name somewhere and they and he was recorded in all the genealogy that I inherited by the name of David Nathan Thomas. And I spent a considerable amount of time looking for David Nathan Thomas without luck and also looking for and what we assumed was that the Nathan was the mother was his mother's maiden name. And we knew his mother's name was Sarah, but we didn't know what her, her or we thought we did, that her name was Sarah and that uh, her, her uh, surname was Nathan and we couldn't find Sarah Nathan. So that was kind of a mystery for us for years. And finally, after looking through a lot of Welch records and, and putting together the places more specifically, we were finally able to figure out that his mother's name was not Nathan and that he never had a middle name and that his mother's name was Morris. And so we, we were able to move backwards. So understanding that this was something that took <clears throat> many years to do, but you may be today, we, I'm talking going back in time, but today we have the resources and it was because we have all of these resources that we were able to finally uh, go through that process and identify his mother and his father, by the way, both of them were found. So take the time to learn. There are uh, websites that'll lead you into being able to hear Welch and understand a, a little bit of the language. And it might be helpful in doing your research if you picked up uh, vocabulary of that. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Appreciate that. Let's see if we have any questions or whatever. Nothing in the question box. Anybody out there? Let me repeat. Uh, if you tuned in late, um, it was uh, there was a time change on this particular webinar. We changed it from 5.30 to 5 o'clock because of a conflict. 
And uh, these webinars are recorded and you'll be able to watch the entire webinar as it is posted to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And you will also be able to see it uh, through a link on the BYU Family History website. Let's see what we've got in the chat. Uh, are the slides available? Yes, I can make them available. I can uh, send them up and we will add them to our uh, archive of slides. Anything else? No, let me stop sharing here then. And I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful um, presentation today, James Henry. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for our next webinar, um, which will be on June 30th, not next week, week after. Um, and then a recording, oh, and that will be a Family Search Q&A with Catherine Grant. Um, and then a recording of this webinar will be made available next week and you can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.